start now. So, hi everyone. I'm Jeremy Rabino. I'm Sagra Vice President and I'm very happy to welcome you today for our very first Sagra webinar. Um, in a few minutes, uh, you have the chance to enjoy a very nice uh, presentation by Jack Van Loon, I'm pretty sure. Um, but I know that some of you are not familiar yet with, with Sagra um, and what it is, so I will start with a very quick introduction about this. Um, actually, SAGRA is the chapter, the student chapter of the European Low Gravity Research Association, what we call ELGRA. And ELGRA is a platform for scientists interested in life and physical sciences in outer gravity, whether it is uh, microgravity or hypergravity. So all this was created exactly 40 years ago. This year is the anniversary, by the way. And this whole community is meeting every two years uh, at a symposium. Um, and the next one will be, for instance, uh, in Granada in Spain in, in September this year. So um, among the main goals of, of ELGRA is uh, the will to um, involve young people uh, in space research. And they do this by educational programs, uh, like, uh, for instance, with the European Space Agency, Every year, uh, they organize um, a training course uh, um, in gravity-related research. And for this reason as well, six, six years ago, they decided to create a student chapter that became what is now SAGRA. Um, um, so now, uh, at the moment, we are almost 200 members from all across Europe. Um, and our goal, to put it shortly, is to create a network of students doing research or willing to do research in the gravity related fields and to also help them to build their future career. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, I'm going to take a very, very quick example. Um, imagine that you are interested about what you're going to see in the webinar today. I'm pretty sure uh, it will be the case. So you become a member. Membership is free for students. And you have some ideas of, I don't know, biology experiments to perform. Uh, in a parabolic flux, for instance. Next week, you get our newsletter and you see that some students have already, uh, from SAGRA, have already performed uh, parabolic flights uh, in, uh, thanks to us. Um, see, it's a good idea, but I'm alone. I, I need to find other uh, team members. So you go to our Facebook page, you say, hey guys, I have a, a very nice biology experiment. I'm looking for teammates so that we can apply to the uh, ESA call. You find members, um, you are lucky and maybe talent, talented, so you get selected and uh, you get nice results. Now, what do you do with the, these results? You want to present them uh, in an international conference. And here again, SEGRA actually can help you because um, you can apply every year. Uh, we have at least one call for grants that is open um, and up to 700 euros uh, to help you for your travel expenses and so on. So that's also very nice for you if you want, as a student, to present your research in an international conference. So if we sum up, I don't want to take too much time with this, but SEGRA is a platform that can help you uh, to get information about what's going on in the world of altered gravity research and also the various opportunities you can get. It gives you access to a community of students, but also of experts. And that's why we are here today, for instance, via the webinars. Um, and finally, it helps you to present your research in international conferences, build your future career, and so on. So if you're not a member yet, uh, you can subscribe on the website, and, and the link in, is in the description. Um, but know that we have some background information. Uh, let's go back to the core of our webinar um, and welcome uh, Jack von Loon. Um, so Jack, can you hear me? I'm going to switch on your video yeah i can hear you okay um so jack van loon comes from the amsterdam university uh, medical center it's also he's also a support scientist at isa estac um and even though he got a phd in bone cell biology that was already in amsterdam uh jack has been involved 
both in physical and life science research in ultragravity. That's for the last decades. In addition to this, Jack was the president of ELGRA, the same ELGRA I was talking about, between 2007 and 2011, and got the ELGRA medal in 2017. Throughout his career, he had the opportunity to use all the microgravity and hypergravity platforms you can imagine. He had experiments in parabolic flights, on a space shuttle and the ISS, on the Bion satellites, on random positioning machines and final stats. If you don't know what these are, then you will learn more uh, during Jack's presentation. And as well as on the large diameter centrifuge at STEC, for which he took part in the development, by the way. So who else than Jack would be better suited to start this webinar series? The answer, uh, maybe no one, and that's why we are here today. Um, so Jack, I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation. I'm pretty sure that's also the case of everyone here. So the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, uh, Jeremy. I'm a bit scared to say anything now with such an introduction. Um, okay, uh, Jacques Fallon, I'm from Amsterdam, working both um, uh, at the university and at ESA Aztec. Uh, a quick introduction. Uh, I'm working with Bone, I'm currently affiliated to the VU Medical Center, working with the craniofacial surgery department, involving in 3D printing and patient-specific applications of, uh, of 3D printing in, in the medical field. Uh, as you might see during the presentation, I have a, a particular affiliation to centrifuges. Um, the left one is a very small one I used during my PhD. These two centrifuges are currently used one for cell biological work and then the LDC uh, at STEC for larger experiments in the eight meter diameter system. And this is a, a, another project we're working on. This is a large centrifuge for people to live in for weeks or months under a mild hypergravity condition. Of course, as a scientist, you need to uh, do publications. And um, um, so we had uh, several, uh, more than 100 publications and, and book chapters and so on. Um, the funding agencies, I have to uh, remind, I mean, we cannot do this work if there's no money available. So uh, over the years, these entities uh, somehow contributed financially or uh, in kind to uh, whatever work I presented here. Uh, over the years, I was involved in various flights, uh, uh, shuttle flights, uh, Russian flights, uh, space lab uh, missions, uh, ISS uh, uh, missions, and uh, parabolic flights. Um, I also worked for industry for a while, especially at the Bradford Engineering. Uh, one of the major payloads you might know is the microgravity science glove box. I was involved in implementing that one from a science point of view, but we also did experiments on uh, or engineering on the BioLab container and glove boxes are the main uh, topic at, uh, at Bradford Engineering. I mean, especially in spaceflight, in any research project, but especially in spaceflight, you never do these things alone. You always have to have uh, a team working together, as uh, Jeremy said, also, if you go to apply for some experiments, it's always a team effort. So uh, I'm telling here something, but it's really you know, the work of many people that have been uh, involved over the years. Okay, gravity and mass. I mean, we talk about gravity today. Uh, the reason we have gravity is mainly uh, because we have mass. And if you look at the top left here, uh, you have two masses, M1 and M2. And uh, because they have a mass, each they attract each other, and that provides you gravity. The larger the mass is, the stronger the acceleration, the stronger the, the, the attraction between these two masses, or if they are closer together, also uh, the strength of the, uh, of the uh, acceleration or uh, uh, gravity increases. If you look at our solar system, of course, you have a very, this is not on, on scale, but uh, to make the point, we have a very large mass in the center, the sun, and there we have the planets uh, rotating around it. And because of this very high mass of the sun, I mean, we have these um, uh, planets around it and they attract each other with a certain G level. Uh, but also on the planet itself, we have a certain G level. And if we look at the force involved, uh, and the general uh, law here is force is mass times acceleration. And if we look uh, to this on Earth, we say that force is mass times gravity. And the gravity is then the, the 1G you have uh, on Earth in this sense. In order for gravity to have an effect, um, you need to have mass. As I explained earlier with these two uh, uh, planets here. But here I did a very simple experiment in the LDC Center Futuristic where I took two balloons, one of them filled with air and one of them filled with water. So air is a very light, hardly any mass. And of course, the water balloon has a much higher mass than the air balloon. 
So if we put them in the centrifuge and look at what happens if you uh, expose them to a higher G level, you see that the ones with the largest mass uh, deforms much more than the one with the lighter mass. So in order for gravity to have an effect, you need to have mass. Without mass, no gravity effect. Um, on the other hand, a lot of people talk about microgravity, which is actually a wrong term. Maybe we can discuss that later, but uh, the better term would be free fall or even um, uh, near weightlessness. This is uh, a description of this free fall condition done by Isaac Newton in his book uh, Principia from 1687 where this uh, uh, Gedanken experiment, so, uh, you know, uh, a model experiment, where you have an, a cannon standing on the earth, which shoots a cannonball at a certain speed, so then the cannonball ends up at a certain distance from the, from the cannon. With a higher speed, it ends up further away, and so on and so on. At a certain speed, the cannonball never falls back to earth again, but falls around the earth. And at that speed, you are actually in free fall. And this is exactly what happens also with uh, a space station and other, um, uh, and other orbiting spacecraft. They're really falling around the Earth and that provides you the, the microgravity or near weightlessness uh, environment. You have other platforms like parabolic flight. You see an example here where uh, you are on the spacecraft. The spacecraft accelerates for a certain period of time and then it more or less uh, shuts down its, uh, its engine. So it falls, it first falls up. Uh, and then it falls down, and in this uh, bluish uh, period, they are in a period of free fall, the same free fall as you see here around the Earth, but then only in a parabolic, uh, in a parabolic shape. And depending on the aircraft, it takes 20 seconds. If you do that with a fighter plane, which also some experiments have been done, you can do this uh, for more than a minute or, or even, even two minutes, depending on the speed. You have the same with these sounding rockets, although uh, the parabola is much higher and, and longer lasting. It can be with a maxis up to uh, 13, 14, 15 minutes with this rocket. And then with these new, uh, let's say, commercial spaceships, like here, Spaceship One from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, forgot the name, uh, Spaceship One. Uh, it also has a parabolic flight uh, for uh, in the order of a couple of minutes. Uh, Virgin, sorry, Virgin Galactic, that was the uh, the company developing this. Okay, so uh, talk always talk about microgravity or what I mentioned earlier, near weightlessness. Never talk about zero gravity. Zero gravity does not exist. Um, uh, Mathematic or let's say physically, it does not exist. Certainly not in our solar system. There's always gravity around. As you remember, we have the sun, we have all these planets. I mean, there is a gravity field in our solar system. There is a gravity field in our Milky Way, there is a gravi gravity field in the universe. Although uh, the forces are very, uh, very small, there's always uh, a gravity field. So in that sense, never talk about zero gravity because it doesn't exist. If you go to, um, let's say, for in, in, in an area such as space station, you have not purely uh, uh, nearly uh, a weightlessness, you have all kinds of disturbances. Uh, within ISS and, and other orbiting spacecraft. For instance, the disturbance here on the, on the left top, uh, because you go to the dark side and the light side of the Earth, when you orbiting the Earth, you are in the light in the dark period, and that changes the, uh, the drag a bit of the very, uh, uh, very uh, light atmosphere you still have. And that change in, in pressure uh, uh, changes the, the drag you have, ergo changes the acceleration you have. It's very small, 10 to the minus 7, but it's a, a disturbance of the field. You have solar radiation, which hits the, uh, um, the orbiting spacecraft. It also gives you a very small acceleration. Um, you have space station itself, in this case, that generates um, uh, um, uh, gravity because of its mass. I explained earlier, you have these, uh, these two masses that attract each other, while space station itself is a mass, and because of that, it also attracts um, uh, you know, other parts in space station. Again, very small, 10 to the minus nine. Another great disturbance in, in, uh, in ISS or in other places as well, is that you have all these fans and turbines and, and pumps and what have you, which generate vibrations within your system. So that's also, um, not something you do want to have when you are doing very sensitive experiments. The same as uh, human activity, and especially if you go, uh, if you're using treadmills and so on, which might disturb the, uh, uh, the microgravity field. And the last one, there are more, but the last one I want to point out is if you, if you orbit around the Earth, um, 
you come over places where you have more or less gravity. Gravity is not uniform on the Earth. It depends on the mass. And if you go over mountain ridges like you see here in the Andes or here a small point of the, uh, of the Himalaya, I mean, at these points, you have higher G levels than uh, in other places. So if you orbit uh, around the Earth, you have small fluctuations of the gravity level. Hence, you know, talk about microgravity on the weight weightlessness, never about uh, zero gravity. Okay, I just want to point out a couple of things. We have limited time, so I cannot go in too much detail in all these parts, but uh, gravity has an impact on all these um, uh, parameters. So it has an impact on weight, on sedimentation, on buoyancy, convection, and hydrostatic pressure. And I want to give, um, you know, one example or maybe one or two examples of each. Weight. Um, this is probably not what you expect um, uh, from this presentation, but what I'd like to, to point out here is uh, if you look at, on Earth, and I just uh, pointed out the Himalayas, where you have the Mount Everest, which is about a nine kilometer high mountain on Earth, uh, the highest mountain on Earth, while the highest mountain on Mars is 26 kilometers high. And if you if you see the, the difference between these two, it's about a factor three. You know, it's about three times higher a mountain on Mars than you have on Earth. And the reason for that is, is that the gravity level on Mars, it's about a factor three smaller than you have on Earth. So on Earth, you cannot, sorry, on Earth, you cannot have any mountains that are higher than these nine kilometers of Mount Everest. It's, it's just not possible. The material is not uh, capable of, of, um, of uh, coping with such, uh, uh, with such an acceleration on Earth. So there's, in geology, you see the impact of gravity. You also see that in life sciences. This is, again, um, from Galileo Galileo, um, uh, a quote from his book, uh, which says that man cannot build a house, nor nature can construct an animal beyond a certain size without altering the design or material. And here you see two bones from an elephant or and from a, I, I forgot which animal this was, but uh, an animal with a lower weight. And you see that um, although the shapes are similar, you see that the, the, the diameter of this um, uh, elephant bone is much uh, larger in comparison to its uh, length than you have with this other bone. So because of this higher weight, the animal needs to adapt its, uh, its anatomy in order to be able to withstand uh, you know, the higher weights uh, due to the gravity field it's living in. Sedimentation is another, uh, another phenomenon that is directed by, uh, uh, by gravity. And this is a picture of the inner ear uh, we all have. The inner ear has uh, uh, several functions, uh, and two of them are related to, uh, to movement. You have the semicircular canals, as you see here. They are related to angular movement. When you, when you shake your head, um, uh, I mean, you will, you will know by the fluid uh, uh, transport in these canals that you are moving your head. And there are other two. Um, compartments, the saccule and the utricle, which are the one for linear acceleration, and that's what you see here. You have these hair cells with the uh, microvilli on top of them, and there you have otoconia, which are, let's say, crystals sitting on top of a, a gel-like material. So if you accelerate because of inertia, these um, uh, crystals will, uh, you know, stay behind if you if you accelerate, and this is what these hair cells will pick up. So uh, this is how you you feel from your inner ear, you feel the acceleration you're going through, and that's in, in, in two directions, what I said with the uh, utricle or saccule. And that's important, especially if you, um, if you, uh, if you look at some animals. I mean, they, are, they have a very good developed uh, vestibular system. If you look at this uh, chicken on, on the left, you see, and I put my pointer, keep my pointer at the eye, the eye is really very stable with respect to the uh, movement of its body uh, the person makes. The same here with this owl, um, because it's important for them if they go hunting or if they have to flee for some, uh, some predator, I mean, they have to be uh, sure that they, their, their vision uh, stays, uh, you know, stays uh, in focus and so on. And for the cat is, of course, uh, you know, if it jumps, uh, it wants to, uh, to land on four feet. Um, other examples of sedimentation in physical sciences, one of the, uh, one of the work done also in, in, in spaceflight is the work on dusty plasmas. Plasmas is the fourth state of material after a liquid, a gas, and a solid uh, materials can exist in plasmas. Uh, and this is what is called a dirty plasma. So you have a plasma of a certain kind with small particles in there in order to be able to see the plasma. 
So this these sort of experiments with uh, with plasmas can only be done under a weightlessness uh, environment. This is a nice example of a big uh, 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 water drop on a, on a plant. For technology, there's a lot of work done on sloshing. So here we see a tank with uh, fluid in there. Uh, of course, if you have a tank in in an, in a satellite, it you know the the fluid or the uh, the fuel doesn't go to the lowest part because there is no lowest part. Uh, although you want to make use full use of the uh, of the fuel you have, so there's a lot of studies done on how to cope with uh, fluid filled uh, volumes under microgravity conditions. A lot of work done also on water drops, how they behave under different gravity conditions. This is um, a rhizoid, which is uh, let's say a, a, a sort of um, a sort of root of a, of a plant. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, where you see that under microgravity conditions, these heavy particles, a bit comparable to the otoconia, you know, these, these crystals for the inner air in the humans or in mammals, uh, you see here these heavy particles in a plant, which if you put them under microgravity conditions, they float up. And this is also the reason why a plant knows the direction of the gravity. And this is for technology to make, uh, to make latex spheres, which are very homogeneous under microgravity conditions, if you do the same assembly of these squares under 1G conditions, you see this uh, inhomogeneity in these materials. This is what I said, I uh, want to explain this, this thing with the, um, with the starch granules, the heavy particles in the root tip of plants, that's what you see here with, um, uh, with the coleoptiles emerging from these, uh, from these beans. And uh, you see that the, that the root is really growing down, this is the gravity factor going down, and the shoot is going up. And this is because they have these heavy particles uh, in their root tips um, where they can feel the direction of the gravity factor. This is an example of one cell in there uh, with the G factor here. So if you rotate this cell 90 degrees, you see that these uh, heavy particles will settle to the side of the cell. And then it knows that the direction of gravity has changed and it will adopt its morphology, as you see here in this plant, which is, uh, let's say, put at about 90 degrees. And then it grows back in a, let's say, normal, normal direction. Um, so that was uh, on uh, sedimentation. Now coming to convection. Um, convection is, of course, uh, you see uh, when heavier materials are settling down and lighter materials go up in a gravity field. So I don't know whether you see this video, but you have a very slow uh, flow of, of uh, particles and fluid through this loop. And this experiment, uh, this is what you see at, at 1G conditions in, in a gravitational field. If you would do this same experiment with heating up this fluid loop under microgravity conditions, you won't see any change in this, uh, in this fluid behavior. It will just be static. This is a flame, a flame at 1G, where you see the, uh, here in more detail, where you see the air which is heated around the flame goes up. It also brings oxygen to the flame, so that's why it can burn. Uh, cold air goes down, so you have some, some treadmilling here of, uh, of warm and, and cold air. So this is at 1G conditions. This is exactly the same flame under microgravity conditions, so you do not have this convection here. So this flame uh, works purely on, um, on diffusion. So this is a diffusion-limited um, uh, combustion uh, flame. A lot of experiments done are also a bit comparable to this flame uh, on crystal growth, where under microgravity conditions you have a much slower uh, growth of these crystals, but they are more pure and more, uh, and more defined as you would have under 1G conditions. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of uh, crystal diffraction um, uh, data and, and detailed data, um, the idea is to do these experiments under weightless conditions to have better crystals for, uh, you know, to find out the protein structure of whatever you have. This is a nice image of uh, one of the Russian cosmonauts, Sergei Krigalev, uh, who, did, uh, who, who burned a candle actually in, uh, in Mir uh, several years ago. I'm waiting for the next slide, if it comes up, yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, another example of convection is, uh, um, if you go to the lower part, the surface tension dominated convection or the gibbs marangoni convection, that is what you see here. Again, it's a surface tension driven convection. This is not gravity dependent. This is what you see all the time. But the reason I pointed out here is that a lot of work 
in, uh, in uh, microgravity and uh, space in, is done on, on this convection process or the Bernard Marangoni convection with thermal capillary, uh, again, which is also just exists under, uh, 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 you know, independent of gravity. Uh, but the point is, you can do these experiments very nicely under uh, weightlessness conditions because you don't have the disturbing effect of the convection you would have on Earth. So you can have much more detailed data and do much uh, more defined, better experiments under microgravity conditions. The other thing which is gravity dependent is uh, hydrostatic pressure. Um, here I took an example of hydrostatic pressure in, in humans, but the same exists for if you go for bubble experiments under microgravity conditions where you don't have you know, uh, uh, hydrostatic pressure within your uh, experimental cell as you would have uh, on Earth. For humans, it's the same thing. If you go to the lower uh, lower part here, this is under 1G conditions uh, where you have your bloodstream going uh, 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 over your body. But the point is, uh, because you have a gravity factor, there's a higher pressure in the lower part of your, uh, of your body, so in your legs, than in the upper part of your body. However, if you go to uh, microgravity conditions, you this, this pool of gravity on your blood and lymph is, is gone. So that means there's a lot of, a lot of uh, fluids are remaining in the upper part of your body. This is also seen here. 1G conditions, microgravity conditions, you have a fluid shift to the upper part of your body. This, your body adapts a certain, uh, let's say in four, five, six days, uh, the astronauts pee a lot relatively. Um, so they have a, a balance again but with less, uh, less fluid within the body as they, if you compare it to the uh, 1G condition. And that's fine. The problem rises actually when you come back to Earth. When, uh, when you come back to Earth and you don't do anything or you don't do too much, um, gravity pulls down the uh, blood and the lymph in your body again, and then you can lose consciousness. This is called uh, autostatic intolerance. You also have that with uh, uh, with some uh, uh, malignancies with patients sometimes, or when you drank too much uh, the day before and you uh, you stand up uh, quickly in the morning, uh, you might feel dizzy uh, for a couple of seconds. This is also also orthostatic intolerance related because uh, your body is not yet capable of supplying the sufficient blood to your brain, and this uh, causes the dizziness. So in astronauts, you see these, these chicken legs uh, because the fluid goes up, so they get very thin legs. They also got a more puffy face, so it's very good to get rid of your wrinkles in a very short period of time. But there are more severe issues. This is a paper from Donna Roberts uh, in New York, um, um, New England Journal of Medicine from a couple of years ago, uh, where she looked into the brain morphology for um, astronauts, for long duration astronauts, and you see also a change in the uh, in the soul size, so the, the the white areas here between uh, between the gray parts of your uh, of your brain, either pre uh, pre flight, so before they went to a, you know to a long duration space flight, and after. So you see a change there. It is not yet known exactly um, uh, what the cause of this is, but it might well relate it to the uh, you know to the fluid shift you have in the body. Next slide uh, is gravity machines. Um, if you think about gravity uh, and you want to know about gravity, I first have to explain you have two kinds of, let's say, activities, space related activities. One of them is, let's say, more related to operations. Uh, if you go for life sciences and crew, you want to keep the crew uh, happy and healthy for the duration of their mission. So there's a lot of uh, uh, science done uh, you know, operation relation, operations related sciences to keep your crew uh, healthy and happy. Uh, on the other hand, from a physical point, point of view, you also want to have uh, system functioning. So there's also a lot of applicable work done, you know, how to deal with, with fluids in under microgravity conditions or how to deal with combustion under microgravity conditions as well. So this is operational sciences. On the other hand, you have basic sciences. And this is that you want to understand what gravity or what acceleration does in your system. Come back to that later. So this is an overview, uh, you know, a pretty uh, extensive overview of, of the systems you have to either look into hypogravity, so anything below 1G, or hypergravity, anything uh, above 1G. So if you go to uh, below 1G, you have systems, what I explained to you before, you have parabolic flight, you have these suborbital flights, 
And then you have these orbital flights with the Dragon Lab, the ISS, the, the, the Chinese space station, which comes up, or the Soyuz. Um, and then you have microgravity simulators, uh, the random positioning machine, freefall machine, the magnet, and the Kleinerstat. I come back to, uh, to most of these uh, in a couple of minutes. On the other side, you have hypergravity, so anything above 1G, where you can use uh, centrifuges, this one we, we use for, for cell biological work, uh, plants and animals, or human centrifuges, uh, most of them are used for, uh, for pilot training, for fighter pilot training. But you can also use uh, magnets, and you have this, uh, this Daemona device, which also generates uh, high Gs, but also a lot of uh, disorientation. It has seven degrees of freedom. The random position machine. If you think about gravity, gravity is a force, and every force has a magnitude and a direction. So if you want to play around with that force, you can either play around with the magnitude, or you can play around with the direction of both of them. So what we do with the random positioning machine is uh, we put the sample in the center of the uh, of the rotation here, in this very small black box you see now, that one. Um, and you rotate uh, the machine in a random way. So with respect to the sample, it does not know or does not feel the direction of the gravity factor because it changes all the time. There's a time uh, issue involved here. You need to change the direction, uh, let's say, faster than the system can detect a gravity direction. But that's then, um, uh, that's then up to a particular system. But that's the idea, that you change the gravity vector all the time so the system does not know what the gravity vector is. This is in 3D. You can also do that in 2G. Then you talk about the Kleinerstat, and uh, uh, it rotates around, uh, let's say, a, a horizontal axis. And also there, you can theoretically say if you rotate uh, once, 360 degrees, then you average, then you averaged out the gravity vector over time and gives you um, a microgravity simulation. Of course, it's always a simulation. You are still in a gravitational field, so you always have 1G, but the direction of the gravity with respect to your sample changes all the time. It is uh, a pretty easy and neat uh, uh, system, this RPM. I mean, this is some experiments we did with, um, with Arabidopsis, with the, the standard uh, 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 laboratory plant. A lot of work is done with, with Arabidopsis. Uh, you see here on ground, so with 1G, you see that the roots are growing down. And you see in the RPM simulated microgravity that the roots are growing in all, in all directions. And again, this is related to the starch granules I explained to you earlier. Uh, where under in ground condition you see them at the lower part of the cell, in flight you see them distributed all over the um, uh, cell, and if you use microgravity simulation, flight simulation, you again see them distributed all over the cell. So this is what provides this response in the this phenotype in these um, in these animals. We did similar experiment also with Drosophila um, with the fruit fly. Uh, when we compared the RPM experiments with uh, experiments done on, on, on the ISS, and they very well match. There is a downside on, on artifact, on, on uh, uh, using uh, uh, Kleiner stats and, and using um, uh, RPMs, um, and that is that you have also fluid movement within your system, uh, depending on what uh, system you have, but for sure, uh, if you use cells, for instance, you don't want to have any air bubbles in there because it gives you a lot of shear. But if you remove all these air bubbles, you still have uh, a system where you have fluid and cells which are of different density, specific density. And if you start to, to move them, of course, you have um, inertia of your system and that generates shear forces. Depending on the, on the uh, container your cells are in, um, you, know, you can generate shear forces in these, uh, in these systems and you should be aware of that. This is a nice work uh, done by, um, by Hammersbach, um, where they looked into fluid movement of uh, either in a Kleinerstadt, so the 2D system or the 3D system. And you see that there are quite some difference between these, uh, between these two systems under um, uh, either a 2D rotation or 3D rotation. A similar experiment, but with a biological specimen is done by uh, Jens Hauslager, um, where you see that under 3D conditions, uh, you see much more fluorescence in these animals uh, uh, due to shear forces in this liquid. So the RPM is a very useful tool, but you have to know, uh, you know what you do with this system. 
let's say a new uh, a more uh, a new trend within gravity related research is also to look into partial gravity and i better go to the next one as well so this is the rpm which rotates uh, uh, over time you have this change in gravity factor over time and if you plot this in in uh, 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 if you plot this gravity factor on on a, on a, on a on a circle, not a circle, on a ball, you see more or less even distribution of your uh, rotation of this ball over time. However, if you if you deform this ball, let's say, if you if you make a, a prolate a, a prolate spheroid uh, of a certain size, you skew the gravity vector uh, average in that system. And if you do that, you can. Um, um, orient your sample in a certain direction for a certain period of time average over time this generates a simulated partial gravity yeah if you do that let's say you have your sample might be more oriented downwards for a certain period of time than upwards so depending on this relation between up and down force um, you can generate you know any g level between uh, you know between zero and one simulate the g level between zero and one so you can make moon g or mars g uh, in that uh, particular scheme. So we did that in uh, in in these in, in one experiment we published uh, last year, um, where we had this uh, this RPM I just explained to you. Uh, this is this one where uh, it averages out gravity over time, but with this with a, a preference to a certain direction. So you can, for instance, uh, have a partial G uh, moon related. This is a regular RPM, so that's really, let's say, a market gravity simulation. And this is another uh, way to simulate partial gravities. You take your RPM, uh, so you have a simulated microgravity, and from this uh, simulated micro G, you uh, use a centrifuge to generate any G level you want. In this in this particular setup, we can use it up to 2G. Um, so you can, you know, do experiments at 0.1G, 0.2, 0 0.3, whatever um, uh, G level you want. And we're still uh, developing that one, but it's uh, it's a promising uh, technology to uh, you know to be used and to to think about how your system would respond if it really goes to moon or Mars. And of course, you know you have this system, but you know combine it also with the centrifuge to explore the full G spectrum, as uh, as is seen in this uh, in this image. You know, for uh, you can use centrifuges, you know, on ground to explore the high G uh, fraction. Uh, you can also use uh, centrifuges in flight. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, to to look at these fractional g forces in flight, and or use ground uh, simulations to uh, to generate these uh, these uh, partial gravity uh, uh, levels. The other way to simulate microgravity or even partial gravity and hypergravity is to use magnetic levitation. This is an example of a, a magnet at the Nijmegen University in the Netherlands, but you also have systems in, 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 in the US and in Canada and in France, um, where you have a very high, go to the, this is a bit of magnet where you have the borehole here. This is where your samples are in, this is the magnetic coil. And this is what you can see if you do these experiments. So I'm, we're looking into the borehole here. So we have either water drop levitating, here a strawberry levitating, or here a, a frog or a trot levitating. It is alive and it was still alive when we took it out. Um, these experiments were done by Henri Geim in Nijmegen. He actually, uh, Henri Geim is, maybe you know him from the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011. He got the Nobel Prize for the graphene, uh, for the discovery on graphene. Well, he also got uh, a prize for this work and he got the Ick Nobel Prize, so the alternative uh, Nobel Prize for this work on these levitating frogs. Uh, the reason for this levitation is that you have a huge uh, gradient magnetic field in this uh, uh, in this situation. And this magnet, I think, goes up to uh, 17 Tesla, I think this was. So because of this huge gradient magnetic field, um, uh, you can levitate any atom, any uh, material you can think of, including, uh, let's say, diamagnetic materials, as you have in, in biology for, um, uh, for that matter. There is a downside, also here there's a downside on using these sort of um, uh, alternatives or um, uh, uh, simulated microgravity, is that you have this huge um, uh, effect of the magnetic field as such. Yeah. 
So you have to be aware of whether your system can tolerate this huge um, uh, magnetic field uh, uh, lines. For the biology, you see that a lot of biological ma materials uh, are made of uh, polymers and they align in, uh, in strong magnetic fields. So uh, in biology, there's quite a change you see uh, in responses. But for, um, for physical sciences, especially uh, liquids, you can, use it, uh, you can use it very well. So the question is always, if you do an experiment, uh, what uh, do you use? Um, so you have um, here uh, two uh, models um, for animals to use, uh, either a rat or a chicken. And this is just an example of what model system to use. You see some other model systems here at the, at the bottom. I mean, if you go to the red, you have a, a quadruped animal. I mean, you don't have a fluid column as you have with the humans. I explained earlier, the mass is reasonable. If you go to a chicken, it has a fluid column more likely as, as humans. It's biped as humans and the mass is a bit higher. So we expect more effect on the chicken than on, on the red. There's a lot of work done also on mice where even the, the effect is lower, expected to be lower than on these two animals. Um, the Japanese used a lot of fish, especially Medaka fish. You see them swimming here. Hopefully you can see it. Um, where, and it's another model system uh, where you can see uh, they looked at uh, bone changes and, and, and mineral density under microgravity conditions. You lose bone, as you can see here in these flight animals compared to ground animals. So the, the fish model is uh, a very, very good model also to look at various uh, bone related cell types and, and muscle, muscle experiments. Um, maybe you heard about the Kelly uh, Kelly brothers uh, uh, experiment where this twin uh, uh, where one of the twins flew let's say uh, uh, later flew the other one flew earlier on uh, so there's a lot of attention um, uh, for this kind of experiments I'm not very impressed personally I'm not very impressed by this uh, by this um, but they set up I mean this is an, an n of 1 or n of 1 1.5 or whatever you call it I mean it's a very limited uh, number of samples I'd rather see these guys here uh, if you if you want to say something about uh, what gravity does to to a system you rather uh, take a, a, a larger n than just uh, an n of one or an n of 1.5 for these two uh, two uh, astronauts i skipped this one um, so i mentioned that there are uh, quite some centrifuges also used uh, uh, on ground and in flight this is some centrifuges used for, for human uh, research. And especially if you go under microgravity conditions, it's very unhealthy. You lose bone, you lose muscle, uh, your immune system is deprived, cardiovascular system goes down, uh, your cognition goes down and so on. So what people are working on, especially for long duration missions, is to, to give, um, you know, to, to challenge astronauts while going to Mars, for instance, to a gravity load uh, while in flight. So to replace uh, or to counteract the, the microgravity effect, making use of these short arm centrifuges where, where um, you know, astronauts are, can be exposed. Uh, a lot of work is done on ground uh, using uh, animal centrifuges. So we have uh, several centrifuges in France and the UK and, and in Japan and, um, and in America, where a lot of animal studies uh, have been done uh, and are still uh, being done in in, uh, on ground uh, to learn about what the gravity or the impact of gravity is uh, on these animals. A lot of centrifuges are also used in flight, and this is just an example of several mostly used for biology, um, where also this partial gravity, as I explained to you before, you can also generate moon or marshy within, for instance, the cubic, which is one of the, uh, let's say, mostly used uh, facilities for ESA at the moment, or uh, a biolab, where you see the centrifuge here for biolab. So where you can expose your samples, I think up to 2G. Uh, EMCS for plants is not there anymore. Some older facilities that uh, doesn't don't fly anymore. This is a human centrifuge uh, uh, we worked on for some time, but it's not materialized. Maybe it's gonna uh, there's gonna be a human centrifuge in the uh, in the JAXA module or the um, the NPLM, which is going to be launched in a I think, couple of years. So there's, there's lots of centrifuges used in flight to either generate a 1G in-flight control sample and or to generate partial gravity in flight. So this is your in-flight part. Uh, but I think if you, if you want to say something about gravity, I think you should explore the full gravity spectrum. So all the way from microgravity to XG. 
whatever the XG is for your particular experiment. So do the lower gravity and partial gravity experiments in, in a free flying uh, uh, spacecraft and do the hypergravity conditions you can easily do on ground. Um, one of the things you can do with ground based uh, uh, centrifuges is uh, you, can, you can make an inventory of how your system responds to hypergravity conditions, whether this is either a linear uh, 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 and to extrapolate this data from your hypergravity to your lower gravity part. So that could either be a linear relationship or there could be some hyperbolic uh, relationship. So this is work you can do on ground to say something what might happen under lower gravity conditions. And this is an example of that. This was from University of Glasgow. This is one of the spin your thesis, a student experiment we did um, a couple of years ago, where they looked into the, uh, into the efficiency of a hypersonic drill which is used to drill in, in the surface of, a, you know, of some planet or a, a meteorite, uh, a, body, a bodily system with a lower gravity than Earth. Of course, we don't have a bodily system with lower gravity than Earth, although not uh, nearby. I mean, you have to go to the moon, for instance, to do that. But what you can also do is to do these tests under various hypergravity conditions, as you see here in these, uh, in these experiments, and then extrapolate this data so this is these hypergravity conditions here. And then you can extrapolate this data to a lower G environment. So you can say something about how this drill might respond on Mars or on Moon based on centrifuge experiments you did on Earth. Another experiment in exploring the full gravity spectrum is Graderset, where they looked into uh, uh, metal alloys uh, solidification. And this experiment was done in the sounding rocket, um, and of course uh, related to your 1G reference, or under hypergravity conditions in this LDC here at Destec. Um, and I think this is a good example of how you should do, if you want to learn something about gravity, how you should do your experiment. Uh, you know, first work on, on the ground as much as possible to learn about your system and to learn about how hypergravity respond to it, and then also use it in flight in sounding rocket or ISS or other platforms or drop towers um, to see how it responds on the real microgravity conditions. Um, this is another profile uh, which is called the reduced gravity paradigm, which is especially useful for life sciences uh, experiments. If you are in 1G conditions as we are on Earth at the moment, and if we are launched uh, to a microgravity environment, you have this adaptation. Yeah, and there's an adaptation time so the system response that could be a, a human or a plant or an animal or a cell, the system response in a certain period of time to this new microgravity condition. The hypothesis of the reduced gravity paradigm is that you do the same thing, but now you, you, you generate a steady state, for instance, at 3G of your uh, system, and then you lower the G level from 3 to, to 1G, for instance. So also here you have an adaptation uh, to this lower G environment. Um, and the hypothesis is that this adaptation is similar, not the same, but similar as if you would go from 1G to microgravity conditions. So also making use of centrifuges, you can learn about very fast um, uh, responses of um, uh, systems under, uh, under low gravity conditions. We did one of these experiments with Fish a couple of years ago, together with Mark Muller from University of Liège in, in Belgium. Uh, in the centrifuge, here you see these uh, very uh, young uh, uh, zebrafish uh, going to higher G levels. This experiment we did uh, for five or six days under 3G conditions. And what you saw in these experiments, besides a change in the otoconia, the inner air uh, crystals I explained to you at the very beginning of this um, uh, webinar, you see that you have a decrease in mineralization in these uh, otoconia, in these zebrafish under 3G conditions. On the other hand, you have an increase in mineral deposition in the mandibula in the upper jaw of these animals uh, due to high gravity conditions. But related to this reduced gravity paradigm is you can also design an experiment where you have a steady state in these animals for five days at 3G, and then you lower the G level for one day to 1G, and you can identify uh, a series of genes you, that are expressed only because of this change, so not because of the high G conditions, but only because of this lower G conditions. Um, and then you can identify these genes, and most likely uh, uh, is that these genes or the pathway for these genes uh, will also be changed if you really go with this animal from 1G to a microgravity condition. 
uh, you can see, I mean, this is published in, in, uh, in uh, Frontiers in uh, Astronomy and Space Sciences, so you can read up on it. The basic point here is that you can only see these changes in reduced gravity paradigm for fast changing systems, so the red, the red systems here. And not in slowly changing because then the impact of the gravity level where you go to itself has a higher impact than the change you, um, um, you came from. Okay, um, so with this, uh, I think we come to a bit of an end. Uh, in terms of ground-based research, you see the generation and application of extraterrestrial environments on Earth. It's a book that was made, uh, um, you know, for Elgra uh, by River Publishers. Uh, I, I say here free download, but I checked yesterday, and apparently this book is not free downloaded anymore. But I will I will look into it. Uh, it explains you uh, various systems you can use for ground-based research uh, in preparation for flight or to develop your flight experiment a bit further once you have done a flight experiment. So uh, I think it's worthwhile. It's both for physical and life sciences. So I think it's worthwhile going um, uh, to this book. So some take-home remarks. Uh, remember the difference between, uh, uh, there is a difference between mass and weight because of gravity. Gravity impacts weight. Larger samples, larger animals, or larger systems show a larger impact of gravity, so size matters. Uh, use the appropriate animal or other model for a particular question you have. Near weightlessness to study gravity, um, uh, near weightlessness to study obscured um, a phenomena like, like the, uh, the Maragoni convection I meant, mentioned. The, uh, to understand the impact of gravity, you should use the full range, so from nearly zero gravity up to X gravity for your system. Uh, prepare and um, re-evaluate flight studies in ground-based facilities as much as possible. You, it's a very reliable and, and, and you, can, you can tweak your experiment and do it again. And ground-based microgravity simulators, simulators are quite useful in space-related research, but be aware that there are artifacts. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your um, attention. If there are questions, I'm still available. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Jack, for, for your presentation. Um, yeah, indeed, it was really interesting to to see how intermediate gravity levels can uh, be studied, actually, because we always talk about uh, hypergravity uh, in centrifuge. We always talk about normal gravity on Earth and um, on zero gravity, for instance, on the ISS. But we very I mean, not often we talk about this intermediate intermediate gravity levels, and it's quite interesting to see uh, these uh, that we can do this on Earth as well, especially in the context now of uh, also the, we have the ESAP address um, uh, at the moment, and they study also artificial gravity. So I think this talk was exactly in the, um, in the, the context uh, of the moment. Uh, so no, um, you cannot see anything uh, on your screen now, but I will, switch to the presentation to the chat sorry um, so if anyone has question i will see them and i can ask i mean, can ask this question to you okay okay do i switch off my full screen thing or just okay. leave it uh, so um no you can you can go on like this so that everyone can okay. see the presentation if you have to go back okay so the first question uh, is, uh, you said that larger samples show larger impact of gravity. Do cells have enough weight to feel or perceive gravity? Well, this is one of the, one of the questions that keeps me ticking for the last couple of decades. Uh, if you, there are quite some um, uh, papers done, theoretical physical papers, or let's say from theoretical physicists, explaining that gravity has very little to no, no effect on, on, on cells, especially not on prokaryotes, so uh, like bacteria. Uh, maybe on larger cells, um, uh, like mammalian cells, and then especially the nuclei, which is a heavy part of the cell. But it is really, you know, this is really one of the pending questions, how does a cell uh, perceive gravity? We know from plant cells that you have heavy you know, heavy starch granules in these cells. But if you go to what we call a non-professional cell, let's say, uh, you know, a white blood cell, a lymphocyte or a fibroblast, um, I mean, they are not really meant to, to sense gravity. I mean, and you do see all these uh, uh, publications and experiments done 
where you see that cells do change with respect to uh, with respect to gravity or the lack thereof. I mean, what is the mechanism that is still not really known? Um, and, and this is one of the, I mean, we now for the last 10, 15 years, we go to the area of biophysics more and more. I think it's now also more clear that the mechanical environment for, for a cell is as important uh, as the, 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 the bio, biochemical environment of a cell. Um, and I think also gravity can play a part there, but it's still very, uh, very unclear. If you look at the force involved, the uh, the apparent weight of a cell so if you take into account the buoyancy you also have in a liquid environment i think it's around 0.5 piconewton which is a very very uh, low force and uh, it's still puzzling why a cell how and why a cell should uh, be able to to sense this so, so it's a very good question but uh, i think we need to do a much more and more elaborate experiments in the future to really look into single cell responses to gravity. Okay, so there are um, also a lot of questions about uh, this um, magnetic um, magnetic field and magnetic and how to uh, reproduce microgravity with a magnetic field. And a lot of people uh, wonder um, how it's, it is done actually, and um, if there is any disturbances due to the radial magnetic field, where we can find these uh, facilities and so on. Yeah. Well, the the principle I think most people are very familiar with ferromagnetic uh, ferromagnetic phenomenon. If you use a regular, you know, a small magnet and you use some iron. Um, I mean, they they depending on on the orientation of the magnet is either attracted or repelled. Uh, from the magnet, um, every atom, so not only um, uh, um, iron, but every atom is magnetic. You have three categories, ferromagnetic, diamagnetic, and paramagnetic uh, molecules or atoms, I should say. Um, and they're all magnetic, but to a different level. So the ferromagnetic is, let's say, very sensitive to a magnetic field. The diamagnetic is very insensitive to a magnetic field. So if you want to do the same thing as for the ferromagnetic, you just need a very high uh, gradient magnetic fields and that's what you have in these bitter magnets as I showed you in the uh, in the presentation you also have this is a bitter magnet so it's a resistant magnet which needs to be cooled a lot you can also use um, uh, superconductive uh, magnets I think in Nottingham you have one standing with a superconductive uh, uh, capacity uh, it just provides you a high gradient and there you can levitate any material you want the disadvantage is especially for biology where you have you know materials of different uh, atoms you know in a cell uh, or in you know if you, if you look at an erythrocyte it also has uh, iron molecules in there and these iron molecules are let's say uh, very sensitive to a, a magnetic field while maybe an oxygen uh, atom in there is not sensitive or not that sensitive to a magnetic field but you have both these atoms in the same cell so yes you can levitate that one cell but you also can see that there is this huge gradient within that one cell because of the different atoms you have. And that gives you, let's say, one of the artifacts again of using this technology for, um, you know, for life sciences, where you have these huge differences in various atoms. If you go to, uh, if you go to pure liquids, either, you know, water or uh, hydrogen or some supercooled uh, material, there it's much easier to use that technique because it's a more homogeneous, um, uh, homogeneous response you would have on that, you know, one one atom uh, material or one atom sort material. So it's it's depending on what you need to do. It's it's a very useful technique. Uh, these magnets are around uh, in Grenoble, in in Nijmegen, in in Nottingham, in uh, uh, in Tallahassee, in the U.S. in in uh, in in uh, Japan, I forgot where. So you have various, in Dresden, there's also uh, a magnet. So you have various magnets uh, uh, around Europe and the world. Okay, so um, now we can go even a scale down. We were talking about atoms and so on. Some um, people are asking question about the advantage maybe of studying quantum mechanics uh, like 
Bosenstein condensate and so on in microgravity in hypergravity and in such environments do you know if there is any advantage uh, well, let me first uh, do a disclaimer here. I mean, I'm uh, originally a cell biologist, so I know very little about uh, fundamental physics and physical and, and, and fundamental particles. Anyhow, but what I do know about Bose-Einstein condensates is um, it was actually one of the first um, uh, very good condensates were made in in, uh, in Germany in the drop tower in Zarm in, uh, in Bremen. Um, where they have a microgravity time of about uh, let's say nine seconds if you use the catapult setup um, so there they 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 made these bose einstein condensate uh, and they're really a, a clump of of materials where it's very sensitive to gravity because of its weight although they weigh very little because they are let's say individual atoms i mean gravity still has an impact there so this is why you want to remove the weight ergo uh, want to go to a free fall conditions either in a drop tower or in uh, in real uh, or in, in iss for instance uh, a parabolic flight is a bit more difficult because you still have uh, quite some vibrations it's the, the microgravity level in a parabolic flight is not that good certainly not that good if you compare it to a drop tower a drop tower is much better 10 to the minus six uh, minus five minus six um, so that's why you why you use uh, you know a free fall conditions to keep the bose einstein condensate you know in in its location so it doesn't hit the walls and, and whatever um, more than that i cannot say you know about it okay thank you very much um so i mean we have so many questions that i think uh, we <laughs> we cannot answer to everything but We'll do our best. Uh, there are also questions related to um, the gravity shift um, and how um, are we trying to replicate the mechanism um, which dictate bone density changes as a result of gravity shift? The bone density changes? What is that what you talk about? Can you can you explain again? Is there please? any research trying to replicate the mechanism which dictates bone density changes as a result of gravity shift? Okay. Um, well, one of the one of the um, uh, bone is not a is not a static material. It is it, it has flexibility. Um, so if you walk, it bends very little, but it bends. And if it bends, you have at the side of uh, of the inner side, uh, you know, you have a decreased uh, volume, and the outer side uh, an increased volume um, because of the bending. And bone itself, although it's it's mineralized, it's both um, uh, let's say crystals, mineral, but also um, a protein, um, collagen, in most sense. Uh, so it's it's a sort of flexible material. And within this material, you have uh, it's a hollow material where you have cells, osteocytes, are they called? These osteocytes are connected to each other via like, like, um, uh, cell processes, um, and in this volume, you also have fluid. Now, if you uh, have this this syncytium of cells uh, interconnected, uh, and then you in a, in a structure and you start to deform that structure. Uh, fluid is going to move from an area with higher pressure to an area with lower pressure and this is how cells feel their mechanical environment or how a cell bone cell feels that a bone is used because of this constant uh, fluid change over the cell membrane and then you get all kinds of responses um, now if you go to uh, in the spaceflight conditions you don't use your bone anymore so you don't you know the bone is not deformed anymore yeah and this is and and for that cells don't have this fluid flow over them and then they start to respond in removing bone because apparently um, you know the, the bone is not used so you can remove it you can see the same in um, in uh, in a tennis player where uh, the tennis has not only an increased muscle mass in in its dominant or his or her dominant arm but also an increased bone mass because of this deformation i just explained to you when the deformation is too much uh, the arm starts to generate bone and to a certain extent that the 
level of deformation comes to, let's say, a, a certain bandwidth, uh, let's say a, a normalized bandwidth. Um, so if, it, if the tennister uses its arm, it's within that bandwidth. If it, it, he doesn't use that arm anymore, you lose bone because you get out of the bandwidth and then the muscle and then the, the bone is removed. It comes back into this bandwidth and also the other way around. If you use it more than it was uh, made for at that moment in time, uh, the bone increases in mass, reduces the, uh, the number of fluid flow and then ends up in the same bandwidth. So for space flight, space flight, bone responds the way it should be in, under space flight conditions. You lose bone because you don't need bone. Yeah, use it or lose it. That's the same for muscle, that's the same for other systems. So the biology works perfect under microgravity condition. The problem comes when you have to, when, when the astronauts come back to Earth, because then you might have a problem uh, in terms of osteopenia, sarcopenia. And there was just a recent publication from, uh, from the French group, from Laurence Vico, um, that really uh, you still see a reduced bone uh, content in, in cosmonauts more than a year after their return to Earth. So uh, although some people say that we, we uh, more or less solved the bone issue uh, with astronauts, that's really not the case. Okay, so uh, maybe go to our last technical question, uh, question for from myself. <laughs> um, so it's about the random positioning machines. And the fact that we use rotation to actually change the direction of gravity vector. This is causing centrifugal, centrifugal forces. Have you already experienced uh, problems with this and the fact that if the sample size is too big, then uh, you can observe a gradient of acceleration between the center and the outside of the sample? Uh, well, I made, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, this is one of the artifacts you you have in a in a in a in a kleinostat or an RPM as well. If you if you move too much out of the center of rotation, um, I made a paper of that in in uh, in advances in space research in 2007, I think, where we where I put a graph in there. You can calculate the the deviation from um, you know if you go further from the center with respect to the rotation speed you use. Um, so that is a theoretical uh, response. There's also a thing called inertial shear. Um, that is a paper we did in general biomechanics. Uh, inertial shear is when you use a flat surface in a rotating system. So in a centrifuge, for instance, uh, uh, it goes too far I have to go into detail here. But basically, if you're not in the line of rotation of a centrifuge, but away from that, you generate shear forces. And that's the same you could have in uh, in in a kleinostat or in an RPM, especially with attached cells. Yeah, they can generate geo shear forces. And there is, I think, a paper. So there was also a theoretical paper, uh, and I think there was some work done either at the DLR or the group of uh, Grimm in in uh, in uh, in Denmark, where they used a kleinostat or an RPM. And they saw changes when they moved away from the center of rotation. And this is really uh, an example of, of these inertial shear forces you might see in these materials. So you have to be aware of that. And it depends on your system whether, uh, whether it is an issue or not. And of course, you know, I'm very much in favor of using these ground-based facilities, any ground-based facility. But if it goes to microgravity, I mean, the proof of the pudding is to fly an experiment, you know, in, in so many years to, to verify your setup again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. You have to choose your, your instruments uh, in agreement with what you want to, to show and to really look for the best solution. Um, so, um, now, well, I mean, I think we can close the technical questions and have uh, maybe uh, your opinion about, I mean, a lot of students uh, study biology or study physical science, and they want to specialize in um, space physiology or space biology or space something. Um, do you maybe from your personal experience can give, I mean, you can give advice to these people, where should they start? Um, 
uh, or similar things? Um, yeah, I can. I mean, uh, let's say first, I mean, the best thing to do, whatever you do, is to follow your heart and to follow your, uh, your ideas, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and to have fun. That's the, uh, uh, I mean, that's that's the, the first two things you need to do. So if you have um, the urge to do something in uh, space flight related research, um, you could have chosen a better <laughs> a better arena in that sense because it is quite difficult and quite challenging to uh, to work in this area because of the what I explained earlier, the difficulty to fly your experiments. It is you know, to get an experiment uh, uh, proposed and selected and executed under, you know, in space station or any other uh, free fall, real microgravity conditions, it's pretty difficult and it takes a long period of time. So it is not an easy thing to do. Well, this is one of the reasons uh, you can think of using these ground based facilities with drop towers, climate stats, uh, uh, centrifuges, and so on. So that's a good thing to do. The other advice I would have is make it part of a more uh, a more general uh, subject. So, if you're interested in human uh, in human research, um, you know you might be interested in what I did in in bone and mechano sensing, which is a very general topic. But part of that topic could be, uh, let's say, a microgravity related study. But it's not the only thing you do. So embed it in in more regular sciences. It's also easier for you to get grants or whatever, so it's not, uh, uh, you know, you're not uh, a sort of monoculture only doing gravity related stuff. Well, I do it myself, but uh, I, I can't think of any other people, at least not in the Netherlands, that do the same. Um, I mean, it's very, I mean, the, 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 the amount of, of, of grants, the amount of work is limited. So you have to be, uh, uh, you know, you have to be careful in that. Combine it with something else. So you can always fall back uh, uh, to this other uh, to this other work, or combine it also in terms of uh, the the content and the science behind the various phenomena you see in microgravity, um, and combine it with with uh, you know with ground based research as much as possible. And then for students, yeah, I mean look at the programs ESA has. So uh, you have the uh, fly your thesis. Now you have orbit your thesis. Uh, drop your thesis, spin your thesis. I mean, the, I gave you some examples of the spin your thesis uh, experiments in, in the presentation. Uh, it's fun to do. Uh, you can collaborate with people. You learn a lot, not only about gravity related research, but also in, in how to handle projects, how to collaborate, how to work together, and so on. So it's a good learning experience. Okay, thank you very much for these pieces of advice. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, and if you want to get more information about this ESA program, by the way, um, everything is always in the uh, Sagra newsletter. It, when ESA is launching a, a call for experiments for students, we give you the information, whether it is spin your thesis or beat your thesis or any of these programs. Um, so, I think this. Uh, webinar, this first webinar is coming to an end. Um, I would like to thank you very, very much, Jack, for for this presentation or for accepting this format of the webinar. You know, there is a recent study published uh, in the US saying that now um, there are more um, children in the US that want to become YouTubers than astronauts. <laughs> so maybe that's the, the way to go now and uh, we have to adapt. <laughs> Well, okay. Um, so yes, again, thank you very much, Jack. And, uh, You're welcome. and I hope to see you and we all meet soon at uh, Angra or anywhere else. Yeah, and if there are more questions or whatever, you have my, uh, well, there's my email and, and telephone number at the end, so uh, people can contact me if needed. Okay, we will, we will uh, forward the, the remaining questions to you. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone, and bye bye. Bye bye.